for me. Oh, we're we're gonna so do any it. questions <laughs> that are about the writing process. This is really <laughs> <laughs> there isn't one. It's messy. I love it. <laughs> it makes it hard for people to copy then, right? If they can't see it. Sure. Live. sure let's go with that <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why anyone would want to copy it <laughs> um <laughs> i don't know if we agree with that but okay we're live <laughs> hey everyone welcome to Bye, uh the society <laughs> sarah sarah please say hello you're very excited to say hi <laughs> no i just <laughs> hi everyone <laughs> There they go. They're hopping in. Everyone's very excited. We're very happy to have you. Christy, Dana, glad to have you guys. Oh, there they are. My comments are coming through. And like, I know there's people oh, saying. Oh, Kelly. Yeah, Kelly. You guys, here. that was McLeaners. Wait, <laughs> is that what you call yourselves? Wait, what do you call yourselves? Mc McLeaners, yeah. McLeaners, mm -hmm. yeah. You're the best. And there, you have bookmarks. I'm jealous. Yes. I don't, I don't have those. a bookmark, Kelly. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> on that, girl. Ashley, awesome. Awesome. Well, I think we all know who you are. So we won't we won't waste times with that because people wouldn't be it. Last night we had our book club um, because I just find it's easier with if we're going to have an author interview, it's easier to dissect and talk about books when you're not looking the person. In the yes. <laughs> I'm so glad I wasn't here for you that. <laughs> Sometimes I am there for that, and it's yeah. hard. <laughs> right. right. Well, and not that we, you know, not that there's necessarily like, oh, we got shit to talk about, but it's just easier to be open about things right. without people feeling like she's gonna hate me. Wait, and you guys read that whole series, Scandal and Scoundrel? Because there's did. another group that's reading just the Rogue Not Taken right now. Oh, oh really? So they, I they post somebody posted a picture to Instagram today of like their book talk from last night, and it was just about the rogue not taken. And I was like, oh, is this the same group? But it's not. It's not. Yeah. Well, and we so we we started our um, little group just back in November. Crystal, did we start in November? And we were just yes. one book at a time, but we were going to do this one of these, and then Crystal read the third one first, and was like, I want to. I did. I'm excited about that. How was that for you? It was, I'm sure so I read it was it. probably better that way. I, it was. I read it in <laughs> December, and it ended up being my favorite book of the year. Like I loved it so much. I I still like last night. I spent probably 15 minutes just gushing about it to See, everyone. So Crystal let me. <laughs> came into it not loathing him. So yes, yes. It's, you were an easier sell than so all when I went the back other readers and read about. <laughs> in rogue i was like no this can't be happening so, yeah. <laughs> I, it's funny how that goes because two things about me one i listen to your podcast i already know like certain things right listening to parts of the podcast sure. you i just hear parts of the story and number two like dark romance is my favorite genre so i love when there's an asshole that i'm gonna love by the end of it mm -hmm. so when i get introduced to someone i'm like you're gonna be the hero at the end Okay. Tell me how. All right. So, but at the beginning, it's not so hard with the with Day of the Duchess. If you just start at Day of the Duchess, it just seems like a book where a guy really loves his wife. Right. Why she why she wanna leave me? <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Oh yes, everyone's saying hi. So what we're gonna do while we're waiting for because I'm sure people will still be joining for the next couple minutes. I have a little game for us to start with. This is something that I've decided I'm gonna make all authors do that I um interview because it's it's just fun to see into your brain. And so I did a little sleuthing. Like I said, I'm a podcast fan. So I went to your website and looked up all of your like recommended books. Oh gosh, um, okay. Yeah, we're not doing all of that. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna <laughs> My point being is that I don't lie on that list. So actually, right. I feel fine about it. We can talk about any one of them you'd like. Right. <laughs> with the game of fuck, Mary kill. Oh, my gosh. My favorite. OK. Yes. And so I did I'm ruthless. Yes. Yes. I'm excited. So but only using character, you know, heroes from that list. that I've read. Thank yeah. you. Yes. So <laughs> we're going to start with a round of Cressley heroes. Oh my God. Oh my God. So fuck, Mary kill Lachlan, Rune, or Loth and Lothair. Okay. Well, I kill Lachlan out of the gate. Fuck Lothair, Mary Rune, obviously. That's an easy <laughs> one. I mean, oh, obviously. Fuck Lothair. But they, like, I mean, you're going to get a fuck bay if you're married. I mean, here's the thing no. if Lothair and I were married, I would stake him at some point. He's. Yeah. 
a terrible dude. Yeah. Um. Oh my god. But and also just Rune. Oh, Rune. He's so perfect yeah. in every way. He's so <laughs> poor baby Rune. He's so broken. Oh. <laughs> Yes, I'm just laughing because I just I love it so much. I, I mean, read, anybody I, who listens to the podcast knows that I basically read Rune like once a month, like because I just <laughs> am like I love him so much. <laughs> He's pretty great. He's pretty great. Yeah, I just this one's easy. Good. Okay. Well, then we're gonna move to fantasy paranormal round, and so we have Matic, which I'm sure we know that's from Griffin from uh, Promise of Fire, and then Will Thorne is from from right? Kristen Callahan. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I haven't read that one, so I had to. Oh, had to it's so good. It's so good. Um, Firelight is the name of it. Oh, yeah. And uh, and the premise is, I'm just, now I'm just going to talk about books with you guys. Yes. So the premise of this book, first of all, it's in her steampunk series, which never got enough attention, I don't think. I feel like steampunk doesn't get enough attention in its, like, little corner of the pool. Um, but you can read this one out of order. I started that series with this one, even yeah. though Will, and so Will, um, he has a clockwork heart that uh, is taking over. Basically, like, it takes, the metal in the clockwork heart is taking over his body. And, like, he needs somebody to manipulate, like, he basically, like, the the metal is make, is killing him, the clockwork heart. And the heroine can manipulate metal with her touch. So like already it's just like, so she can like lay hands on him and literally push the metal from the clockwork heart, like back into his, into the the piece, the heart piece. So he needs her to survive, except she is the one who installed the clockwork heart that is killing him. So it's like <laughs> super intense and enemies to lovers, but also bananas sexy. And it's so good. Oh, yeah. Fig's Library. Did you read it, Fig's Library, or did you just... Anyway, it's great. It's great. Anyway, so Mary Will, Griffin from A Promise of Fire. Yeah. Well, so this is the problem, you guys. <laughs> I... So I'm gonna... I, I know that I'm gonna get off on a bad, a bad start with you, because I'm gonna kill Maddox. Because I'm not wedded to that series the way a lot of people are, because there just isn't enough fucking in it. So <laughs> I'm going to marry Will and I'm going to fuck Griffin. Griffin's a hot fuck. He's Final a, answer. He's Final a hot answer. Fuck. Yeah. 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 I feel like you you get three books with him too, which just helps because you see his it's whole as a, as a partner. It's and he's great. a great partner. He not really just- is. There's so much conflict in those books. Yeah. I love those books so much. Nobody mm-hmm. talks about those books enough either. I love, I love it. I love, I love how he's like, girl, you got to do it. He's that literal partner where he's like, you're the one. You have to do it. But yeah. I'm right with you. And yeah. I'm like, so much. So, yeah, Matic. Mm, yeah. I wouldn't fuck Sorry. Matic. He's not a great fuck. But also you got, well, I mean, apparently, because he's not getting it on enough. It's my theory. <laughs> and then He lasted about 0.5 seconds. Yeah. So No, but um, surprising no one, I will marry the sad, poor, broken baby. <laughs> okay. This one. This so one much work. Play too. Had all three of these ones. So now we have a, um, so I have both an old school historical and a regular historical. So we're going to start with this one. Um, <gasps> this I think might cause some hate in my comments. <laughs> oh my god! So just in case people know, Derek Craven from if you don't know, I mean, who Derek is, I'm sorry, Ian <laughs> McKenzie from the Madness of Ian McKenzie, and Dorian Blackwell from the Highwaymen. How would we? How would you do? <sighs> this one's hard. Uh, well, I mean, well, obviously, I marry Derek Craven. Like that's. The, that's that's the yep. logic. I mean, obviously, I'm married Derek Craven, and he carries my spectacles around in his pocket for the rest of our lives. Yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah. um, uh, see, also poor broken, broken baby, like yeah. that, that tracks. Mm. That's Here's tracks the thing: all three of these guys, though. Let's. Be oh, real. it does. It totally does. Ian is a lot of work. I think this is true. And yeah. so, but I think when Ian gets focused, he gets really focused. And so I'm going to say, <laughs> Derek Craven always is true. Yep. Um, I'm going to say, fuck Ian, because that's going to be great. Mm-hmm. He pays and a lot. I, unfortunately, you know, 
it's just by it's it's just because logically one of them has to die. Dory yeah. dies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I oh, that's a good book too. That's yeah. a hard one. Yeah, I would probably just flip with you. Like, I I would marry Ian. I'm obsessed with Ian. All the things he does in that, because I don't know how far you read into that series. Have you read the whole series? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure. Of course. He just has his hands quietly and every. No, always. He's just so oh. in love with her. He's so in love with her. He's yeah. Like, oh. But so, I mean, so is Derek. I would say, yeah. here's the thing if you marry Ian, then I think you fuck Dorian and Derek goes. Oh no! Uh, this is the crazy. <laughs> that's a crazy way of thinking about it. But it, I, hear me out, because I actually don't think Derek is the right guy for a one night. Like if it's just like a one, a one off experience, he's gonna get I mean, obsessed with you and never leave you. Yeah, so. or like he's not gonna be into it for like he's gonna he he's gonna be able to dissociate from the experience in some way. You need Derek to be over the top in love with you. <laughs> yeah. Right, That's or I would pick two. Exactly like Sorry, <laughs> or else he's imagining someone else while he. Fucks. Exactly. Well, I mean, yeah. Which. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That one. That was a fun one. I knew. I was like, oh. <laughs> Ian, Ian's in my top three. He was in my top three favorites from last year. I mean, that book is truly <sighs> perfect. It is a perfect romance. That whole family of of men too. Like Hart, Hart is like he is my second fate. I love Hart so much because I just do. It's just, I mean, she does a great family. Yeah. 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 Anyway, okay. I'll just keep thinking about him. All right. So then I have the old school historical. So I have Royce Westmore from Kingdom of Queens, Reynolds mm. from The Black Lion, and Gideon from Ravish. These are my favorites. These are three of you're right. You picked three, my three favorite old histor old school historical. I listen to the podcast. Yeah. I know things. <laughs> so uh, okay, well, you marry Royce Westmoreland because he's the only one of those three who understands toxic masculinity. Oh yeah. Mm. So like I mean, you can't be married to the other two. No. You, you would end up somebody would end up dying. Yeah. Um, Reynolds he, not a great husband. He's not. He is a ter a truly terrible husband. Yeah. But he is the black lion. So, I mean, if you get a chance to be with the black lion, but Gideon's probably a better, like a more thoughtful lover. Yeah. Mm. Down with Ranulph. Kill him. <laughs> fuck Gideon. Marry Royce Westmoreland, and bring right. feminism to the medieval time bring bring feminism in much earlier than it ever came I in pull this one out. So <laughs> i never thought i'd hear derek craven dies out of derek Actually, craven <laughs> i'm sorry but she changed the parameters of the challenge <laughs> by marrying ian derek craven for the record derek craven does not ever die in my in my version of that <laughs> Oh my word, that's hilarious. Okay, having a great time with this. Okay, so then the last one, we I decided you can choose to By answer. By the way, wait, can I just plug Royce Westmoreland for a second? Because I know you listen to the podcast. And if you don't listen mm -hmm. to the podcast, though, and you are listening to this, are you watching this? People yeah. are very nervous about Judith McNaught, and rightfully so. Like, she has written some real problematic heroes. Royce Westmoreland, who is the hero of A Kingdom of Dreams, is the hero Judith McNaught wrote that you should read. Yeah. And it's because... He literally on page acknowledges toxic masculinity and like how problematic it is for him as a man to be like to have been raised in this world of toxic masculinity, which in the early 90s was absolutely revolutionary on the page. Yeah. Plus, it has one of the greatest climactic scenes ever in romance yeah. ever. But check your content warnings for that one. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely that one's on does the horse die.com. Make sure you check that out. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I know. It, uh, this is how I tell this is what I tell people on the pod on the podcast. This is with my husband edits the podcast and produces it. Yeah. And he was like, for four weeks, the two of you were like, just appreciate that the horse dies. But like no one cares that like Rune is taking heads off of people. Lothair is like, you know has Ellie on death row. None of that. That is all fine. But the horse does die in a kingdom right. of dreams. And you have to get yourself 
through the horse death. Yes, I can forgive person on person violence, person on animal violence. Yeah, it's humans not. are we're really weird. Which, as yeah, like that a, happens. I mean, that, that happens in species. species. Yeah. But it's Stephen like, King what? says that all the time. Like he gets the most letters about the villain. I think it's the stand where like the villain kills a dog in the doorway, like in the first chapter of the book. And mm -hmm. he gets the most letters about that book. Not all the other books where he kills like right. children and people. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're in that for the, like if you're reading a Stephen King book, you're in it for the horror, but you hurt animals. Like that's how you show pure evil. Yeah. Or you have a hero, like a mercy kill still hurts. But you're showing, wow, this person understands the sanctity of this animal's life yeah. because yeah. I'm saving it from pain. So, okay. So anyway, this last one, we have one more of these. And you can choose to defer. And Crystal and I will answer this one because yeah. <laughs> I did do the heroes from this. Oh. Year. You can uh, answer. Can I answer this? We would love if you answered it, but I won't uh, be upset if you don't. Wait, who's Warnick? <laughs> Wait, that's temple, that's right? That's temple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait, no, he's not. He's the no, Dear Lamont. The this is the oh, guy, right. Alex. Okay. Oh, these are the three. This more. is the series. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you just gave me a heart attack. That you <laughs> Sorry. Because <laughs> the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, which one is Warnick now? And I'm like, no, oh, it's Alec. Alec. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay, so it's King Alec and Haven. Yes. <laughs> okay, you guys go. Let me think about okay. it. I'm gonna play, but let me think about it. <laughs> I'm in. I said I was okay, in. I said I would be ruthless. I'm in. Crystal, you go first. Obviously, I would marry Haven. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, I don't know. I'm gonna kill King and F Warnick. Oh, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> it's bold. It's a bold choice. We have, I will say, of awesome. these three, I mean, they're, oh my goodness. I know, right? I don't know if you have an answer. <laughs> you realize, hey, guys, I, I went... just, I'm like, I'm writing, like, I'm finishing, I'm editing Cecily's book right now. So, yes. like, I've revisited these books. Yeah. Recently, so mm. I have a new. Well, so have you, but yeah. Go ahead. What about you? Oh, okay. Um, I would marry Haven as well, but I would fuck King and kill Warnick because him and I, Alec and I, we've had work. We've oh, had you work. have? Oh, because he's such a <laughs> dummy. Yeah. I'm. Oh, yeah. Alec. But like he, but yeah, uh, like there are things I appreciate, but I mean, by the end of the book, I'm like, boy. You know, I know. Can, you know, I know. When he leaves her with his dogs, what a dummy! I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I oh, okay. I <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm gonna <laughs> be <laughs> sad. Poor sad babies. Right. That's. I mean. That's always my. So I'm gonna marry <laughs> Warnick. Um. I'm going to fuck King because King knows his way around a bedroom. And I'm sorry, but Mel has to go. No. <laughs> Shocker. I just can't. I will say I literally just edited a scene that Mel is in and it was pretty entertaining. So, yeah. um, you know, that'll be sad yeah. for me. But that's the way it has to be in my mind. <laughs> Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> but I, but like of these three, I feel, I feel like obviously they're all like sick with love for their wives. Yeah. But like of these three, like Warnick's absolute obsession with Lily is like tough to get past. True. Okay, yeah, well, that's true. I just, I feel like we can just end right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay. Well, we'll dive into some of the questions we got ahead of time. And then, of course, you watching, if anything pops in your head, you want to throw up. I don't throw up. I mean, you want to put in the chat. <laughs> Please don't throw up, anyone. It's not that bad. <laughs> uh, but we'll just start with, um, we'll start with some of these and I'll pop them up and we love how you tell stories, so feel free to take oh, your story. It inspired me to write a historical. Yeah. I 
what I came to romance through historical. This is, I don't have a great answer to this question, except that um, historical was my first love and it's my forever love. So um, that's not to say that I don't adore, I mean, like, as you know, I'm, I'll read anything that has kissing in it. <laughs> but for me, historical has always been like the heart of it for me. It's been all my favorites are historicals. And so historicals it was. Oh, so good. I love it. Love I feel it. like I this it. one goes, um, I feel like this one goes well with it since it's right there. If you could tell your, um, I, I had worded this as, if you could tell your baby writing self your one baby thing. Baby well, writing self. I didn't type this question completely. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, everything is better in revision. That, like revision is the most important piece. And then I would, I don't know, would I tell her it gets harder? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I would tell her? I would tell her the same thing that I tell baby writing selves who are not me, which is, celebrate every single win like find something to celebrate about writing every day because we're not you don't publish a book every day you don't publish a book every week most of us and so um if you save it up to only celebrate like the day the book is out you're missing so many of the other little wins like today i finished a chapter or you know today i've finished a sentence <laughs> <laughs> or like today I had a great today I had yeah like today I had a great zoom with readers or like today I like there's something this job is so magical in so many ways but the actual work of it is very lonely for a lot of us for me like I'm I it's a very lonely process right where it's you and the page and your characters and you're doing your thing um, and that can often feel like it's not a success because you feel at the end of it, like, oh, I got this far, but I have this far to go or whatever. But like today and tonight when I go to bed, I'm going to feel that way because I'm not done with my book. And I'm, you know, I'm literally like I'm going to be done within the next like three days. But like tonight when I go to bed and I get into bed, I'm going to be like, oh, I can't believe I'm not done yet. But then I'll be able to say like, I had that great conversation with people today. So, and that's a win. That's something that most people don't get to do in their job is talk to people who love their work, right? So celebrate everything. Keep the fridge stocked with whatever celebratory item you love. love and figure it. out a way to pour yourself a glass of champagne a few times a week if you, if that's your thing. <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> um here's a nice one with that what other sub sub genre romance would you like to try writing or have you thought about it or, so i know. wrote a contemporary uh short story this year while i was in quarantine because i was like i just wanted to do something that was different and so i wrote a short that's in an anthology called Naughty Brits, which starting tomorrow you won't be able to get. So if you want to buy it now, you can. And um, really? it's going back up by itself. So like the, oh. the anthology is coming down and then within the next couple of months, I'll put it back up as a one-off thing. Okay. Um, and that was really fun. That was contemporary. It was set in kind of an alternate an alternate universe 2020 where there was no pandemic and no Donald Trump. And that was really fun. And, um, and it was about an American photographer who finds a Duke like in the countryside. Um, and that was really fun. So I would definitely write contemporary again. It was so, I don't think I, I, what I loved about it was I wasn't doing it. I was, I did it purely for fun. Like maybe it would turn out okay. Maybe it wouldn't. And if it didn't, I just, Sophie Jordan would say, you should put this under the bed. <laughs> and I would put it under the bed. And that would be the end of that. But uh, she didn't say that. And so it came out. Um, and then I actually just, I would really like to write a medieval, like an old school, like big, like sleeps. They, they have to like sleep in his kilt for warmth kind of medieval, his plaid. Um, and I don't know that I'll ever be able to do that in book form. Um, but I actually just wrote a short story, a short medieval story that's basically like lady swordsmith and medieval knight. And it's very short. Um, and it's coming out in an anthology of Arthurian retellings of Arthurian legend in the summer. Um, but then 
will come out separately alone by itself. And so mm. medieval was really fun too. I just don't, don't, oh, here it is. Kelly's question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically it's a retelling of Arthur and the lady of the lake slash Excalibur. Um, the heroine is a swordsmith, a bladesmith. Um, it's called the bladesmith queen. And um, there's a lake and a stone <laughs> and a sword, but it might not be the kind of sword you think. <laughs> um, no, but it's basically like I was watching, I was looking at a lot of pictures of Henry Cavill's thighs while I wrote this. So if you, are, if you like me, feel like Henry Cavill's thighs are, you know, a thing to be celebrated. I think you'll enjoy this. It's not long. It's about 10,000 words. Um, and the anthology is, I'm the only romance writer in the anthology. It's about wow. 12 of us. And it includes like Alexander Chi and Preeti Chibber and um, others who are remarkably talented. And I don't actually know how I snuck into this group because literally when I got the ask, I was like, can I write sex in this story? <laughs> and the editor was like, yeah, we want you to. And then when I turned it in, they were like, oh, you weren't kidding. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, don't take me anywhere. But essentially, like, if I had to describe it, I would say it's about a lady blacksmith, who, a lady swordsmith who um, is exiled from her town for reasons and lives like in her cottage with her forge and her white wolf and one day um a, a warrior comes like into town and he's searching for her because he has found a sword that she made and um it goes from there it's she she has she is a legend she is the legend about her is that if she makes you a sword you will never be defeated Ooh, um, i am and, so excited about that so Love it. I don't know. It's like a little bit paranormally. It's like I wouldn't say it's paranormal. It's like there's Mag like a hint of magic, mm -hmm. but the real question is like, is she? Is it magic or is it legend? Like, can you be? Does, so that's the question that I'm playing with. Is like, is it enough for you to just for people to just believe in you? <laughs> anyway, that that's comment, a terrible actually. description of it, but also it's only ten thousand words, so I don't want to like ruin yeah. it for you. There's not a ton that's that happens thing. in it. Like novellas or short stories are very hard to like. I know. Get it. You're like, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, here's just a here's a fun one. Are there specific things that inspire you to write? Um. I fill the well uh, by watching a lot of like great, I love TV that has great dialogue and like great character work in it. Um, I am, I don't listen to music while I write, but I, I often will hear like a line in a, in a song and think like, oh, that would make a great, that's like a great idea for a song, for a book. Um, actually today I was with my daughter, we were driving in the car for the first time, in, like a long time, but I promised her donuts. So we were driving to like the donut place in Brooklyn that you go to. Um, there are 16 donut places between us that we could have walked to, but like we we're driving to this other place and, um, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, so we were in the car and Lizzo was on and, um, the song Cause I Love You came on, which begins, um, it, it begins, um, I've never been in love before. What the fuck are fucking feelings? Yo, yeah. <laughs> once upon a time, once upon a time, I was a hoe. Now I don't even want a hoe no mo. And like, and I'm like, this is an alpha hero. This is the <laughs> anthem of the alpha. Like he doesn't want feelings. And I was like, oh my God, I literally brought it home. And I like, I brought it home. I like came into the house and I was like, Eric, we have to put this Lizzo song in the podcast. The next time we talk about alphas, like, so I just, I'm constantly thinking about romance novels in my head on surprising no one. And so literally I'm inspired by anything that seems fascinating. And I think like, what would that look like as a romance novel? Like I rewatched about 
three years ago, I watched for the first time the new A Team movie, with which isn't new anymore. It's like ten years old, mm-hmm. and I and it's with um like Bradley Cooper and you know others, and I was like, you know, I love a movie where things blow up. And as I was watching, I was like, what would this look like as a romance novel? And it would look like Hell's Bells. Like, so I was like, I'm going to write the A-team, but with girls and kissing. Love and it. that's what the Hell's Bells are. So <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll see if they work. You can tell me in, in September if you, you know, in August if they work. But <laughs> I think I think there's one that goes with that well that you just said, too. So um, how long does a project usually take you from conception research writing to a finished product? So Which can- it's going to be different for a traditionally published author, I think, too, because of... Oh, for sure. For mm-hmm. sure. Um, conception, once you put conception in, it can be years. Like, um, I, for example, so I usually know the next series by the time I'm about halfway through the current series, which is why the books overlap so much, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and and I try really hard not to overlap them in a huge way. Like, you shouldn't have to read a previous series to read my books. I mean, the hope is you wouldn't need to read any of my books to read a new book. But um, so for example, Hell's Bells, when I was in the middle of Bear no- uh, Brazen and the Beast, I was like, what? I, I started cooking this like new idea of, mm-hmm. you know, a woman, a girl gang, like a Victorian girl gang. And, you know, what that would look like. I was, I knew that I was in the, I know we're not talking about this series right now, but um, when I wrote Daring, I knew Daring and the Duke, like, I had already established in the world building of Bare Knuckle Bastards that Grace, the heroine of the third book, had this like kind of far reaching network of women who she protected and who like delivered information to her. But I also knew that Grace wouldn't have access to certain spaces, right? Like she wouldn't have access to um, the, um, to like Mayfair, to like aristocratic homes or to men's clubs. Like, so where, where would her, network of spies or of like informants end and this other network begin and who was in charge of this other network. And that's when I came up with, well, so her name is, she is the Duchess of Travis and she's in Daring and the Duke, but like her, so she has this kind of, she's like the ringleader of the girl gang Hell's Bells and she has access. She has such power and money and title that she has access to an entire other world of women who are full of knowledge. And so, and that then became the kind of conceit. I was like, all right, well, who are they? What are they called? Um, And I don't know how Hell's Bells came, but like it came early. I was like, they're obviously called Hell's Bells, which means like, that's that's the that's the name of the gang. Um, and then, but I was two books out from finishing Bare Knuckle Bastards, so I knew like so. Then you, it just has to sit sit in the back of your head and cook. And and it was like certain things would happen, and I would like write them. As you can see, I have a very organized process, and um, <laughs> I would like write them down on. You can't see like there's a whole other like this goes on for a while and they're like they're just ideas that sort of then i write on a post-it note and stick underneath like right now it's sort of divided up by book and so i can see like where the all all the all the ideas are and i steal ideas from everyone i mean like you guys could say something tonight and it's like oh that's a good idea i'm gonna put that into book three or whatever (laughs) so i think the question is about really writing and it takes me about eight months to really like from the first word on the page to the last word on like to it going off to print you know to Mm -hmm. being really fully done and um so my year and I write a book a year because I take my process is very like fraught and it begins very slow and then it ends with like I could write you know this week I'll probably write 50 pages or 60 pages um and so the it gets tiring. So then I take a few months off, like I'll take like three months off. And during that time, like cook the next book, but I won't touch the manuscript. And then I'll open them. I'll open the manuscript in like, I don't know, May and say, all right, now it's time to start. And then I'll, I'll write book two. So 
Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> don't uh, do this that way like somebody told me that they write like 700 words a day and which is like three pages um and then you know at the end of three months they have a book and I was like that sounds amazing I should do it that way <laughs> and uh I can't do it that way that's the problem but if you can do it that way don't do it my way it's not good for you know life marriages health like any of it <laughs> sanity <laughs> Today I was talking to Kennedy Ryan, who mm -hmm. also writes that way, and she is also in the same place in her book that I am right now too. And and I was like, this job is for suckers. <laughs> and she was like, <laughs> it absolutely is. Like we were talking about it for a while, and then and then she's like, but this is the process. Like other people, you know, they don't get the experience that we get. And I was like, the experience of feeling like we're having a mental break. <laughs> <laughs> But we love the pain that comes in both Kennedy that, and yours. You know, yours, Jen, so. I tell myself <laughs> that the experience of feeling like I'm having a mental break is why the dark moments of my book get so bleak. Yes. <laughs> so. When you get really mad, you might yeah. just decide to burn exactly. it all over the ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which are some of the most satisfying moments that come about. So th this question kind of dovetailed into it because I feel like you were answering it, but I wanted to make sure I put this one up too, because one of the previous comments I put up too was about how this book we got to see, obviously, those people in the Day of the Duchess. Yep. And we were very excited. So Cecily and Caleb were supposed to get a novella. And the part of the challenge with that was, so Day of the Duchess put me, I mean, this is sort of a, this is going to be just like a kind of nuts and boltsy answer for a little bit, but like Day of the Duchess put me back schedule wise because I threw out 270 pages of Day of the Duchess and rewrote the whole book from the beginning late wow. in the process. Um, like I had maybe two months to turn it in and I had 270 pages and, or not even, I had like a month to turn it in and I had 270 pages and then uh, it was November of 2016 and I looked down at the manuscript pages and I was like, oh no, like this is all wrong. Mal would have voted for Donald Trump. I have to throw this out. <laughs> and that is literally, I had this like moment and I called my editor and I was like, I have to throw the whole book out. Like it's completely wrong. Like completely nothing is salvageable. It has to go away and I have to start over. And she was like, uh, okay. So <laughs> I wrote, so I then wrote, the full day of the Duchess start to finish. And it pushed my schedule back in such a way that then like I ran into Wicked in the Wallflower. Um, and I knew that, and Wicked in the Wallflower was too difficult in a different way because my dad died in the middle of Wicked in the Wallflower. And so where I had sort of said like, oh, I'm not gonna take my four months off. I'm gonna like push myself and get myself back onto the schedule. Um, that wasn't possible because I lost my dad in the middle of it. And so like I had, I ended up taking the time off in a weird way anyway. Mm -hmm. And so the conceit was that after Wicked and the Wallflower, I was going to write Caleb and Cecily's novella and it was going to be a Christmas novella. And like, I had it all kind of set up that they were going to get a like really nice, like Christmas. It was going to be a Christmas gift to all of you guys. Like you were going to get holiday novella. And I had a whole idea that was like short, I thought, and adorable. And then I had the idea for Hell's Bells. And I was like, oh, wait a second. Cecily is a bell. And then it was just obvious that she would be the first bell because everybody knew her and y'all have been e emailing me, <laughs> DMing me on Twitter and Instagram. Cecily at? <laughs> no, you promised in the author's note that we would get Cecily and Caleb, you liar. Um, and so here she is. Like I was, the intent was for you all to have it holiday of 2019, but then I had a better idea. So hopefully you'll forgive me. We forgive you. We do. I, I'm um, so, so excited. Yeah. I think I, I actually said this on another live you were on, but you obviously wouldn't have known it was me. Because hi, first time meeting you. Hi. But <laughs> I like don't read Christmas novellas, so I'm very happy you're writing a book. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I, I've never <laughs> written one. So I've never written a holiday story. 
Well, you know, it feels like, so oh, well, that's not true. I have. I wrote yeah, I a, like, um, I, wrote, a wait, I don't even know yeah. anymore. I wrote, yeah, I wrote that thing. <laughs> yeah, I have a chocolate the holiday story. It's good. That <laughs> holiday and the holiday anthology has always been like very charming to me as a reader. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what it took that novella took me the same length of time a book takes me. That's my Did problem. Really? I'm actually very bad at this job. You should <laughs> not do it my way. Like that novella is a third of the length of a book and it took me almost the same length of time. Mm. This is a good question. I want to throw up this one. Was making all of your books in the same universe always your plan or did you just add them to the universe as you went along? Are you ever going to write a novel not connected to previous books? That's a good question. Um, a I don't, uh, initially it was laziness. <laughs> it's like I needed a, a like dressmaker. <laughs> so obviously I would just use the same dressmaker that I had had the whole time and madame bear like is ageless <laughs> like she just is always gonna be there the, the whole story i mean right at, by this point i'm like 15 or 16 years from nine rules and mm -hmm. so you know madame bear is gonna retire eventually presumably no she's just not she's a vampire she's my yeah. paranormal spin <laughs> spinoff yeah um <laughs> But so initially it was that it was like, oh, well, I need and when you're start when you're like a young author, I mean, when I wrote nine rules and I sold nine rules, the idea of me like being here 11 years later and like still writing and writing books like for a job it was nonsense. Like that wasn't a thing people did. That didn't happen to people like me. Um, so it took me a while took me like until I was kind of in the, um, well, no, that's not true because I knew about Chase when I was writing 10 Ways. Like I knew, so yeah, so I guess the answer is to your question is I have always been drawn to this kind of big universe of stories, which I think I love it. comes I love it. from being in love with like those big old historical writers mm -hmm. who wrote big families who like kept coming back and like there was always a kind of crossover yeah. and as a reader I mean I remember being I was a big big Stephanie Lawrence fan like I read all those sinister books I was hoping you'd, was hoping you'd bring her up multiple <laughs> times <laughs> and like the best thing about those books was like periodically like devil and honoria would, would like kind of yeah. wander by and you'd have this yeah. like great moment and so Initially, it was that. It was like, well, they're going to a ball, so whose house can it be at, right? Like, And then now it really feels like I hate leaving my characters, so they just are all around <laughs> all the time, right? That. So, like, yeah. Nick and Nora are in this book, and that means, like, and there's, you know, reference to the bastards and, like, the work that the bastards are doing in Covent Garden, but also there's a reference to the fallen angel because, you know, like, there's a casino question that comes up and that, or there's, um, you know, bombshell, obviously, Cecily, so, like, you, you will see all of the Talbot sisters again, there's, you know, everybody's back. Yeah. Um, Hopefully not in any way where you will feel like you're missing out. Yeah. Actually, I don't I, think King is back. I don't think King is in this book. Oh, wow. Well. But Sophie is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't topic. think King is, actually. But yeah. Yeah, I... I was I was hoping you'd bring up Stephanie Lawrence at some point because I just read Devil's uh, Pride and the first three. I read the first three this yeah, month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know they're so good. Stephanie Lawrence was the first romance writer who was like, you know what? I'm going to write a 35 page sex scene and you can't stop me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like, well, <sighs> OK, side note, because this is my channel, I'm going to hijack just a second to say yeah, something. Please, please. Because my like start with you as I heard about your podcast through someone made a list of all these romance novel podcasts because I was new to podcasts listening to them and I was like oh I should listen to podcasts about stuff I actually like so okay story time found that so I tend to listen to every episode that's come out most of the time about books I haven't read yet but yeah. I have a short memory because I read I read about last year I read 700 books in the year mm -hmm. so that's COVID's fault sure, I read a That's lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I can listen to your podcast and hear you guys go into deep spoilers for a book. 
And then I pick up the book and I'm like, oh, Sarah said this was a good book. Okay. And I, <laughs> I don't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So then I will go back and listen again. So I had I had Devil's Bride on my list because it was one of the ones you featured. And then I read it and I was like, oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> Those, I mean, I, yeah, it's a classic yeah. for a reason. A lot of these books are classics for a reason. Um, the, right. yeah, it's great. Right. I just, I loved it. And I just told but Crystal last the, time to do it. Yeah. That was the first, the first series I can remember, like really feeling like those Easter eggs have been laid for the reader. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, now you're, you're in this place and you've been here before and you know, these people and look, they're still happy. Yeah. Um, you're waiting for them to get their book too. Like you, you, you're introduced to all of the cousins and then you're like, Oh, when's he going to get his, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I do think Cecily is probably the first. So Sophie is in never judge a lady by her cover. Penelope from the rogue, a rogue by any other name is in 11 scandals to start to win a Duke's heart. Oh. Um, the bare knuckle bastard Felicity is one of the, the girls from Duchess. Yeah. Duchess. Um, so I, and I've always kind of pulled through a heroine, but Cecily is the first one who like exists on the page in a really significant way in a prior mm -hmm. series. And now is the kind of keystone, the, you know, out of the gate heroine in, uh, in bomb in the hell's bells series, but you have not met the others. Okay. Okay. I mean, you've met you've met them in that they were on the page in Daring and the Duke, but you haven't you don't know them. I'm trying to see what other ones are about writing before I go into reading stuff. Because I have a lot of different categories of questions. Ooh, this is a fun one. Is there a character written by another author you'd like to borrow? You mean not? I mean, I have always I like periodically do think about putting cravens in a book. <laughs> Um, but I suppose that's not a good, that's not a good answer. It's an obvious answer. <laughs> yeah, because you got to talk to like, you got to talk to Lisa and be like, Hey, let me do She this. would, I think she would be, Just she's very it. sweet. Like I wouldn't write Derek. I would right. never dream of writing no. her, but her characters. But like, I think if I said like, can I send my character? Although Craven's burned down. So. Oh, wow. Because. <laughs> I know Spoiler. that <laughs> Cravens, Cravens doesn't exist. <laughs> I know that, like, Although it would exist in the timeline, like I would have to do the math out, but like it could exist in my books and be gone now in her books. Right. Um, Sarah, write that on the sticky note. And yeah, put yeah. It <laughs> I will. I'm gonna do. It. Well, no, I don't need to remind myself of that. No. Uh, um, you know, it's funny because Jen was just saying the other because Jen reread all the Bridgerton books recently um, for yeah. a project that she was doing, and uh, she said that Julia Quinn seeded like Cravens is in the Bridgerton novels, and like, um, or no, I'm sorry, Sarah, Sarah from Dreaming of You, it, her book Matilda is in the Bridgerton books. Like somebody's reading Matilda, Where and um, <laughs> yeah, and somebody and like Lady. Oz Baltazone from uh, the cre the Sinster books is in the Bridgerton books. Like the Julie Julia po like populated her books with all these <laughs> people, and so I'm again that's so cool, and it's something that I just like. Would I now I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna start doing. Well, that. and Lady Whistledown, she shows up in some of Eloisa James's books. Yeah, like there. Yeah, Lady, Lady Danbury shows up. Yep. Because I mean, they even wrote they wrote books together too. So yeah, so they're and the thing is, is that we it's a small world. Like we all know each other. So, yeah. um, are there char but are there characters written by other authors? Oh God, there are. I mean, I wish I had. I'd like to borrow all of my favorite characters. I'd love. I mean, yes. You know who should show up? <laughs> Rune. <laughs> there should be a love. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. I just had a moment. You know, there is some vampires who are very long lived. <laughs> How amazing would that be? I mean, why not? Sorry. Lothair pops in. Pops in for a hello. Strolling, strolling <laughs> through the background of a scene. <laughs> is this that would be amazing? That would be amazing. I mean, <laughs> that's a good question. The answer is probably Elisa Claypo's character. Yeah, that'd be fun. I would even have them like someone go shop at Winterborns or something. It's not yeah. 
yeah. he has he has, a, he has like a chain right <laughs> yeah i mean there's i think in one of sophie's books one of her characters goes to fallen the fallen angel oh, that's cool um so yeah love it that's always a fun question i think it'd be cool um how about this one probably the one you're currently writing right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they're all hard in their own way. This is not the hardest one I've written. No. Uh, the hardest book I ever wrote was um, A Rogue by Any Other Name, which is Bourne's book, the first book of the Casino series. Um, mm -hmm. Bourne was an incredibly difficult hero to turn around. There are about 200 pages of that book that never got into that book because I wrote so much wrong in that okay. book that um that was a book that taught me a ton about like character where I had never written I had written like I I'd written rakes and I'd written like decent dudes and I'd written like crusty like Darcy-esque heroes by then but I had never written like a bad dude who like yeah. needed basically that book is morality chain, right? Like he's a bad yeah. dude who needs like love to pull him out of it. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I had ever done that. And so it took you know, Jen talks about like learning to drive a stick in a Ferrari. And that's like how that book felt writing to me. I wish I had had that anal analogy then, like, because it felt like um, I was working with a character who was so rigidly bad that anytime I tried to turn the ship before it was time to turn the ship, he yeah. was so resistant to it. And I am not a writer who believes that my character is like, speak my characters do not speak to me like i am god when i say you are falling in love you are falling in love <laughs> and um born was not like that <laughs> so um that was definitely the hardest but talk about learning so he was the ferrari in that scenario but like learning to drive with him made i think it's so much easier to write haven or um I mean, shit, what's the name of the hero of my last book? <laughs> or Ewan, right? Like it it was, it makes it so much easier to write like a hero who is a bad dude and needs to be yeah. turned around. And now I love Morality Chain. Like that's yeah. one of my favorite things to write. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He's my favorite. Thanks. So I, I, I love one too. Yeah. But that one was hard because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to pull it off. It's right. a different kind of art. Like, Right. <laughs> what I have learned over whatever 14 books is that the hard, the fearing being able to pull it off often is the reason why the book works so well at the end, because like mm. you're thinking, I'm constantly thinking like, can I pull this off? If I'm not worried about that, I worry about the content, like the quality of the book. Sure. What well, I was going to say, so what I love about A Rogue by Any Other Name is that I love, like I said, I love dark romance so much. So when the beginning yeah. of the book is like a captor captive situation, I'm bad. like, oh, Sarah, what are you yeah, doing? It's <laughs> real bad. I mean, well, I get a lot of, now, especially like that, that book is, came out in 2012. Like it's an old book, right? It's like a last generation of romance almost. And um, certainly that like beginning with the kidnapping and the like, you know, they're the the wedding night scene, like she has had she is not like out of her mind drunk, but she's had a drink. Um, and so like there is like there is a lot of I get a lot of pushback on him. Sure. And my answer is often like, Yeah, he's terrible. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you are right. He is terrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I laugh about it so much because like I can I understand people's you know concerns or feelings about stuff but I'm a my like moniker is the dark romance queen and so my favorite book from last year was one called Untouchable I don't know if you've heard of this book it's a it's a high school bully romance I hate those so I'm yeah. just saying I get it but it has one of the most I don't even think he's redeemed by the end kind of heroes. Mm. Um, and it's just because I love when an author, that's why I love dark romance is I love when I'm set up with a situation where I'm like, there's no way in hell yeah. that this ends happily. Um, so when I can see that in a historical romance where it's, you know, more tamed down than a dark romance, I get really excited because those are the things that I love in a romance is when yeah. I trust the author 
that they've set me on this track that I'm like, no, there's no way these, there's, there's no way I'm going to believe it. And then yeah. when I do, I'm like, <sighs> there's this scientist, um, in Oklahoma, a, a professor in Oklahoma called um, Jennifer Lynn Barnes. She also writes YA novels, but yes. um, she, her research is on fiction and the brain and um, popular fiction in the brain and how mm -hmm. we as readers, the things that sort of push what she refers to as like our universal pleasure centers. And mm -hmm. so she has this idea that there are six essentially buttons installed in us as humans, like as um, she she's a primatologist. She like most of her research is in was around a particular kind of monkey like in the south pacific and there and and how you know they're so sh using that like primatologist work and then coming into popular fiction and thinking about like the brain and um she believes that there are these six buttons that essentially when they're pushed give us universal pleasure and they're things like money and power and beauty and um you know sex like and there and also the foils so like money and po like and poverty or like beauty and and ugliness or um you know power and the lack of power and the kind of di the the way that those two things play together um in storytelling often like delivers you a story and competition is one of them and one of them is danger right but it's what she refers to as safe danger because if you read a book that has a dangerous situation for a character, whether or not they turn out okay in it, right? Like whether or not they win or lose in that dangerous situation, at the end of it, you, the reader, are safe. And you know yeah. that you are going to be safe through the whole experience. So this is why horror movies sure. work so well, right? Like is that you enjoy the experience of watching danger and in many cases watching like traumatic experience on on the screen with like a ghost or a vampire or like in saw for example and right. but at the end like you're fine you just yeah. sat on your couch for two hours and that concept of safe danger i think when we talk about dark romance or we talk about morality chain or we talk about like heroes who do bad things and then like are pulled through to light right mm -hmm. we're often forget and we think about like how we criticize those those kind of little subgenres in the in the um the larger romance pool i think often what we're doing is discounting this idea of like this is a universal pleasure the idea of watching danger and like knowing at the end that you and sometimes and often the character in our case like will be okay um it's not real life right so yeah yeah you're allowed like to like your dark romance. You're allowed to. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, also my other, like, if you were stuff. like, this is my actual <laughs> life story. This is nonfiction. I am living it as the heroine. I would be like, that is a problem and we need to have a talk. But like, <laughs> enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be alone in real life. He can stay far, far away yeah, from Yeah, like me, marry I mean, your high school bully. Do not do that in real life. Do it. But do it in the book, and that's fine. Love it. Love it. Here's one. Let's pop this up there. Love seeing diverse rep and bare knuckle bastards. Can you speak to writing representation outside of your experiences and maybe your plans for diverse rep in the Hell's Bells series? Please. <laughs> yes, with pleasure. Um, I have written diverse rep in all of my series, um, and that is because I try to people the world authentically when I write. Um, historicals. I do better now because I know more now. And I, when you know better, you do better. Um, mm -hmm. But I have tried from the beginning to write people of color and queer people on the page. Um, I do not believe that it, as a sort of cis hat white lady, I don't believe that it is my role to write um, POV characters who are outside of my lived experience, mm -hmm. which is why people like Nick and Nora are there on the page and they have a love story and they're like present in Brazen and the Beast and I think are rewarding for readers and for me in Brazen mm -hmm. and the Beast. But there was a reason why I chose to write them in the perspective that I wrote them. And that is because I wish that there were more women who loved women writing female, female romance. And I wanna lift up those voices and make space for those voices instead of taking over that space. So, um, the diverse, there is a lot of diverse, diverse experience in um, 
Hell's Bells already. There is there are characters who are all, who are seated in the first book who have a long arc to take over four books. Um, and but they are none of them are POV characters, um, and that is intentional. And um, my hope is that sometime sooner rather than later, there will be enough people writing own voices historicals that I can then take on writing a POV character with a diverse lived experience. But sadly, right now, that's not the case. So I like to recommend books by other people. <laughs> I love that. I love um, that. And I like for the world to look the way the world should look. So um, mm -hmm. that's why it often feels like we're looking at secondary and tertiary characters in my books who are diverse. It's not because I don't want to write them. It's because I don't think yeah. it's my place yet. Yeah. That's well, perfect. and maybe someday they can take your lovely series and make it a Netflix series, and then they can cast us a section <laughs> of them. And yeah, I mean, I'd like for them maybe not to put a person of color on the cover of my books, but um, yes, I would call your friends at Netflix and let them know. <laughs> I'm very open to all casting decisions. <laughs> Here, this is a really cool question. Are there books of yours that readers discover depths that you didn't realize were there? Yes. And what's some your percent? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a talk with um, um, the McLeaners over the summer, and there was a question that was like, what's the meaning of the desk in Never Judge Lady by Your Cover? And I was like, what desk? <laughs> Um, and then when it was explained to me what the desk was, I was like, I don't think there was meaning in the desk. <laughs> like, um, I always, I mean, readers see so much and sometimes it's there. Like sometimes it's like, yes, thank you. You noticed. Like often there are things that I put in and I'm like, nobody's going to notice this. Nobody's going to notice how hard I work to make this <laughs> happen. <laughs> and then like you get the email that's like, hang on a second. Is Wicked in the Wallflower a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin? And you're like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, but then, um, you know, oftentimes there's stuff that's packed in there that people don't notice. Um, but then often there are questions that come from readers and they're like, these magnificent analysis, like with magnificent analysis of like what I was doing. And that I really, truly believe that no writer is doing everything that readers and English teachers think they are doing. Um, but I am, I'm very flattered that you think I am that smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about books, though, because it's that it's that like line of like no man steps in the same river twice, you know, and it's the same with the yeah. book. Like no one reads the same book twice, well, you know, I've so said, yeah. I've said a lot on the podcast that I actually don't own the books, right? Like they don't actually live until they are out of my hands. Like they are, they live, they are in, they are mine. And like, you know, they are the 400 pages that I have written and then they belong to you guys. And they, you, ex you all experience them in really powerful, different ways. Like, and some of you really hate them <laughs> and some of you really love them. And like, that's okay because it's a big pool and I'm very lucky that more, I think more of you love them than hate them, which is nice. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, the, um, but that's the whole, that's the whole of it, right? Like I can tell you how I feel about Mal and Sarah's relationship, right? And like what it meant to me to write Alec and Lily. But ultimately your experience reading those books is the most valuable experience. Mine is. Yeah kind of irrelevant at the end of the day is that I'm, hard i did to... the job and <laughs> now you get to ex enjoy it right um is it hard it is easier as i get older or i get more <laughs> like seasoned in writing um in mm -hmm. the early days yeah it was hard to like read i remember i can remember reading like my first negative review of like nine rules to break which was yeah. like, I like, it was everything to me, that book. And, yeah. um, and I can remember feeling like, oh my God, like, this is terrible. Yeah. And now, like, I mean, I heard the other day, I was, I, somebody told me that, um, the top review on Goodreads of, um, 
uh, No Good Duke Goes Unpunished is like a legendary one star review on Reddit. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh. well, I suppose I'm flattered by that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, I actually know what review they're talking about. The person who wrote the review, it's I, I cut and pasted it into a Word document. It's like six six pages long. And like Whoa. she hated that book. And there's but at the same time, like she read it, like she it made her feel things. Like, yeah. At some point, <laughs> at some point, part of you I mean, you have to feel like the book belongs to everybody else because if you let it belong to you, it's per too personal. You know, I gotta I gotta get up in the morning and write again. So right. I also think it's easier for me in many ways because my style of writing is for every book to be just a little bit different. Like I don't really write the same book over and over again. And I I don't say that in a pejorative way. Like I think a lot of authors are better at knowing their brand than I am. Like there's the sense of like they know what the book, what the reader instinctively wants from their book mm. and they give it to them. And my books, you know, every heroine, you know, my heroines can sort of be bucketed, I think, into sort of general themes. But I tr I'm, I'm often writing a book that I've never written before, which is mm -hmm. a scary experience. And it goes back to that thing that I was saying about fear. But yeah. um. I also think that now that I'm 14 books in, my readers know like, oh, well, if I didn't like, you know, A Scott in the Dark, that doesn't mean I'm not going to like The Day of the Duchess. So um, I'll just put that book away and like read the next one. And I think mm -hmm. that's really valuable that my readers trust me enough that like if one didn't work so well for them, they know there's another one coming that will. Yeah. So exactly. I agree with I definitely agree with that because I feel like each of your books that I've read because I've read I've read 10 of 10 of them mm -hmm. it's like there's always something that I enjoy about each one so whenever I pick up a book I'm like oh I don't quite like this track of it I'm still having a good time like we talked about this on our book yeah. club last week, is it's like even the ones where I'm like um oh, I don't feel so great about him but I love this part of the story yeah. so I'm still having a great time and also I listen to all of your books and I mean Justine ah. Oh, you funny. love Justine. Oh, good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, she's a great narrator. She, oh, yeah. She's love really her. awesome. <sighs> um, no, but I mean, like the series that you that you watch, I mean, that you read the to talk about. I mean, the difference between King and Sophie, Alec and Lily, and Sarah and Mal, like those three books are not the same. Like no, not there's at all. nothing totally about agree. those three books that is the same. And so yeah. um and I wish I could say that it was like intentional that I was doing series and all three books would be different, but like it wasn't, it's just those three books were not the same. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, but I think that if you are a romance reader and you read all three of those books, you will find that one of them really does speak to you. So yeah, definitely, I don't know, maybe that's my trick. It's like, you got to keep buying Sarah McLean books because you never know. <laughs> Right. Well, I was going to say, it feels like yeah. something that you are always able to do is there's always that moment in one of your books that just like feels like a punch to my heart. Like it just like I it's such a visceral experience. The emotion that I have when I'm reading your books that I'm like, I don't know how she does it every single time. <laughs> like I don't I don't feel like that about every book that I read. I feel like that's such a rare thing to have when you're reading a book and you feel everything those characters are feeling and. It keeps me coming back. I love it so oh, much. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's my favorite part of reading romance. So when yeah. I come at a book, I come at it with like, what's that moment going to be? Because I want, that's all I want as a reader is to feel like, yeah. oh my God, all is lost. Yeah. Look how yeah. emotional these dumb babies are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is, this one has right into that then. So I'm based on the ones that you've read, what are some books that you've read and found new meeting when you reread them? That is, I feel like, so I feel like this is often a thematic thing for me. I think as I have grown as a person in my real life, books take on new meaning. Um, I think a lot about the fact that when I was, you know, 20 years old, I didn't care at all about marriage of convenience or about like second chance love stories as far as I was concerned. Like none of that was relevant to me in my life. And so like anytime one of my favorite authors wrote one, I was like, oh, now I just have to like plow through this because I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but now of course like those kind of like i love a second chance romance i love yeah. you know and when i mean i've never written a widow but like i love a, i naima simone writes these gorgeous widow books and like when i was 20 widows were not of interest to me in any way mm -hmm. unless they were virgin widows um and now they have more interest in so there's that but also i think like when i the podcast has really given me an opportunity to go back and revisit books that I feel are in my DNA, like books that I have loved and also do it with an anal with an eye toward analysis. Um, and so things like Lord of Scoundrels, which I have always thought was like one of the best books in the genre. Now going back and reading it, I'm like, oh my God, like this is a different, it's not a romance the way people expect a romance to be. Like this is a this is a different kind of book altogether. It's telling a completely different kind of story. It's doing a very different kind of work. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel that way, you know, now that I'm a writer, often when I go back to those favorite books and I reread them, like we talked about A Kingdom of Dreams, I didn't realize why A Kingdom of Dreams was my favorite book until I reread it for the podcast and was, and like reread it with an eye toward like thinking about this book. And discovered that like all of my books are about toxic masculinity and like mm. so is this book right <laughs> so i think um the cool thing for me about rereading all of these books that i have loved for so long now as a writer is that i'm also getting a real look at my buttons and how they were installed yeah. and like the echoes of these books i mean i think people who listen to me on the podcast and then read my books are probably very much like, well, of course she loves Derek Craven. I mean, look at this woman's yeah. entire <laughs> work, body of work. My best friend who has only ever read my books romance wise. Um, the beginning of February was like, um, I'm going to have to read this Derek Craven book. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> what this is, but like, I'm getting it. Cause you're, I mean, my entire Twitter feed is just you and your friends talking about Derek Craven. <laughs> And so she's like, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. And she texted me a couple of nights ago and she was like, I literally started it and two chapters in, I'm like, obviously this is your favorite writer. Like, this is like, this is Sarah's antecedent. And I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. like I think of romance as a big family, a big tree, right? Like if you, you could like sketch out the family tree of romance and you would, you know, and there are these kind of massive arms that come off it. And like, there's the Kleypas arm and like out there on the end, like a little bud on the end is McLean. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really important thing for me. I love to think about like, who are the ones who came before me, who are informing my my work all the time. And it is like that Kleypas arm is an arm off of the McNaught arm, which is an arm off of, you know, the Charlotte Bronte arm. I could draw this for you, but we'll do it another time. Love it. That would be fabulous. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, Lord of Scoundrels. I just love when read. I love all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lord of Scoundrels is one of those books that, like, when people are like, what do you give to people who think romance is stupid? Like, mm -hmm. if they are interested in just novels, like, beautifully written, like, crafted novels, it's, it's Lord of Scoundrels. Yeah. Which has its problems. I get, like, I get it. It's old. Yeah. I mean, all the old ones do. Right. Um, but you don't throw them out. You sort of yeah. make them better. You yeah. evolve them. When you know better, you do better. That's the whole story of romance is when you know better, you do better. So this it. question is far in the past now, so I can't click on it. But since we were talking about like what we don't throw them out, we build off of them. Someone did ask about your opinions of Kathleen E. Woodwiss, and I've heard you talk about her before, but if you talk about yeah, because I um about a year and a half ago I tried to read The Flame and the Flower. And no, I was, it's not. I can't do you it. Can't yeah. read The Flame and the Flower as a reader. You just can't. Yeah. You have to read it as a historian, right? Like you have to read it yeah. for as a like text. Instead, yeah. it's it's school. The Flame and the Flower is romance school. Yeah, and I'm mm -hmm. interested in romance school, but you don't have to be. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, right. Look. I, I think what it was, we, I know this is, this is one of those things that like, I, I, you know, I try to spend less time on Twitter than I probably do, but like, I see it go by the like discourse about like, we have to throw out what it was. And yeah. I mean, I, 
I don't think we can throw out Widowis. I think th- I, I think she's important. I think she's important for a million reasons. And yeah. I know that we don't. It's one of those moments where you're like, oh, this is a gross, sticky piece of our history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is our history. And mm-hmm. I think like if you do read what do I, if you read the flame and the flower as a historical text and not as like, oh, I'm gonna really like relax in the bathtub. Yeah. 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 <laughs> with these two. Like mm-hmm. it speaks to, I mean, I, I feel like I'm probably repeating myself to a lot of the people who are in the room. So I apologize, but like okay. There is a reason why those romances with assault existed in a huge number in the 70s. And that is because marital rape was not a thing legally. Literally, that didn't exist as an illegal act in the 70s. It feels like 1972 is so close we could touch it. But at the same time, like... Married women weren't allowed to have their own bank accounts in 1972 in the United States. Like... So the idea that that a heroine would have to navigate her way through a toxic relationship with a man who she was stuck with, right? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. ultimately have him come out on the other side, like, as kind of like a proto-feminist. Like, I would never argue that Brandon is feminist by the end, but like, by the end, they have a measure of partnership, right? And, equal- and equity on the page, as a couple and that's that's so valuable as like a historical artifact mm-hmm. not to mention the fact i objected to throwing out widowis and the flame and the flower on the basis of sex alone because yeah. the sex on the page orgasmic pleasurable sex on the page for a heroine who then does not die or suffer additional trauma at the hands of the hero is incredibly revolutionary in 1972 right like without widowis we don't exist sure somebody else might have come along and done it but like she wrote it she was the first one she was Mm not you know before her there were tons of mills and boons categories were a huge thing nurse romances were massive but none of them had orgasmic sex on the page like actually articulated orgasmic sex on the page and i think that's important i think that's yeah. part of our work as writers mm-hmm. um and then, so that all said like setting that aside i think there's also the other piece which is two million books in a year which is an enormous number of books plus telling publishing being basically responsible for telling publishing women read, bought books and read about themselves. Um, There I have obviously a lot of mixed feelings about the text of The Flame and the Flower, but I actually don't think it's that important to the conversation. Um, And I wish we could figure out a way to kind of acknowledge the baby, Mm -hmm. you know, without throwing it out with the bathwater. So, yeah. But I, I appreciate, that, you know, getting older maybe and like, yeah. you know, well, you, you throw my me. early books out either. When you know better, you do better, you yeah. know? Well, exactly. That's what you said even about your own work. And it's the same for, it was busting the floodgates open and letting yeah. it be like, hey, you can do this. And so you need that initial start of anything. It's just like, even how we're constantly learning how to be better allies and activists for people now. Yes. And we're going to fumble around and fuck it up. And we'd like to have the grace of knowing that in 50 years, when they talk about it, they're like, they were trying. Like, this yes, is the yeah. seed we're trying to do it. So, yes. And I do think like, there comes a point, there is a, there is a moment in the road where like, we all should know better about certain stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, and I don't, I want to be cognizant of the fact that like, you know, we're all, uh, you know, a certain type of reader right mm-hmm. here in this room. And like, I do think like we are past the point, like at this point you should know about racism and mm-hmm. not be writing it in your books. Like mm-hmm. you should know about homophobia and not be writing it in your books. And this is not what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying, Oh, well we have to forgive like all the people writing like, enslaved person, slave owner romance right now. No, we don't. That is like, we should have known better years and years and years ago on that. We should have known better from the beginning on that. But so I just want to clarify that. Like, but I think, you know, now, right now today, I, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing the best that I can. Right. And Mm -hmm. 
I'm certain that 10 years from now, there's a pro there's going to be something in this book that I am writing right now that like, when I look at it, I'm like, Oh, really? But I don't know right now. Yeah. Yeah. You can only um, do the what you have now. So. Yeah. I mean, like, I think looking at the books through the lens of 2021 is difficult. It's, yeah. a, it's not fair to, I also think, sorry, you, you've really got me on a soapbox here. I also think the we biggest issue is there's no history in romance, right? Nobody's ever s sat down and written it. So like, there's no, there's no place you can go where you can take romance 101 and like right. learn for. the history of romance. Right. And, um, I mean, like, I want to teach that. So if you, you know, work at a university, <laughs> but like the point is that there's no, there's nowhere you can go and say, it's not in the, it's not in the zeitgeist that like, we all understand what Flame and the Flower stood for. Right. We don't all understand it. I know because I talk to a lot of people and I often get the kind of like, oh my God, I never thought of it that way kind of mm -hmm. answer. And so until we're in a place, so my frustration is when we throw out these early texts and we say like, well, that's not a valuable text in 2021. Like we're throwing out the history of a genre that has largely been the only genre that has ever put marginalized people on the page in joy. Yeah. And like, I don't want that either. So <laughs> class over, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask question here of like, um, have you ever heard it? Because obviously we can't ask her now as she is past is have has the story ever been told of how that book got published have you ever heard it or someone said how, how yeah tell, tell me please can i know i know that no so avon books at the time was not part of harper collins it was a pulp fiction publisher um so it was publishing literally pu what we think of as pulp fiction kind of like you know the 30 foot woman and the gorilla or whatever and um and they were and and it was publishing classics in reprint. So you know right. it was like Moby Dick, but in paperback, mass market format. So like this, okay. yeah, size. like Barnes and Noble um, now and stuff. Right. So um, and it was a tiny little publisher. Kathleen Woodowis would have told you at the time that she was a mid, just a Midwestern housewife, like just a <laughs> woman who lived in Wisconsin. And her husband really loved Westerns and adventure novels. And so their house was like filled with Westerns and adventure novels. And she was like, I would like to read a book that is about a woman where the woman doesn't, you know, isn't like an ancillary piece of the puzzle. And so she decided she was going to write it. And she sat down and she typed out The Flame and the Flower and mailed it to Avon Books which at the time was just this like pulp publisher because that was the publisher who had published all of the Westerns and adventure novels that her husband was reading. And the, an editor opened it up and was like, here's the thing. <laughs> like, here's the thing that <laughs> nobody's ever done. Right. Um, and she, um, the, the editor, she, she was a young woman and she, um, they paid her $2,000 for the manuscript, which actually like is a lot of money yeah. in 1972. Mm -hmm. They put, printed it in, in mass market paperback because they thought that it would be very popular with, with women in supermarkets and drugstores. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. mass market is the right, at the time was the format for women because they could fit them in their purse. Mm -hmm. And still is. Um, <laughs> yeah. My mom yeah. Still <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, it's very smart. You can fit it in your purse. Well, pulp, the story behind those pulp fiction books, which were much thinner. I mean, Flame and the Flower is a beast. Yeah, I was like, book. that's a thick bitch. It's a very <laughs> big book. Um, but pulp fiction is like category length. And the reason why they're that size is because they're the proper size to fit in the back pocket of a pair of jeans. That's hmm. the measurement. Um, so anyway, they, they put it in this and then they... Um, yeah, and she they were like, okay, we're gonna do it. We're gonna print your book. Here's two thousand dollars. And she was like, okay. And then um they sold two million copies in a year. Whoa. And publishing was like, hang on a second. <laughs> 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 um, and Avon hired those what what we refer to as the the original Avon ladies. So it was um Kathleen, Rosemary Rogers, um, Bertrice Small. 
and now I'm drawing a blank on the others, but there were five of them and they were the original and they were all hired to write like, or they had all written in, it was like the second flame in the flower hit Rosemary Rogers, like bought it at her drugstore and like immediately wrote Shanna or whatever that first we're doing was. this now. We're doing this now. Let's go. It's like savage all- love or whatever it was. <laughs> and like, and then it was just like, bam, 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 bam. And mm-hmm. they were all writing these like huge, cause those books are their adventure novels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the first and all those early books, like the first 150 pages of the book is just like bananas might- running around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right here, yeah. through this one. It but is but they have heroines instead of heroes, and that's a huge piece. I love that so much. I did not know the whole story of that. Yeah. And so, and that at the same, I mean, that is, that does not discount like all the work that was happening in category romance at the same yeah. time. And like, um, there were right at the same exact time, 1972, um, Anne Allen Shockley wrote, um, the first like interracial queer romance, you know, wow. right then, um, Avon was also publishing queer romance by men. There's a guy named, um, his name the book is called Gaywick Vincent Verga and he was writing queer Roman queer gothics for Avon wow so like when we stay like this is the other thing that I get annoyed with when it's I'm from the other from like I get I get annoyed when people are like oh well queer romance is new like no it's not 19 like I mean it was (laughs) first of all it's really not new but also Mm -hmm. like right at the same time alongside Widowis and Mm -hmm. the like boom of Harlequin America um were these like very big names in queer romance doing the same thing. And we just, it's just, you know, how we, the work of living in the world, I think in 2021 is like shifting your lens so that Mm -hmm. you can sort of, it's like you need to be wide angle now. Yeah. Love it. Well, that leads really nicely into this one, but I particularly have a little, I want to add a little caveat onto this and ask, have you read Lisa Kleypas' new book yet? And how do you feel about it? (laughs) No. Fun fact, Lisa Kleypas and I have the same editor and my editor uses Lisa's manuscript as my carrot. So when I turn my book in, I get Lisa's manuscript as a prize. <laughs> so- I, love that. I love that so much. That is oh my God. Prize she even, I will say that she texted me a photograph of the first line of the manuscript like a week ago and was like, look what I have. And I was like, oh, I got it right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is very motivating. It's very, very motivating. Um, what do I want to read? I am extremely, what am I excited about? Oh gosh, a lot of things actually. Um, Kristen Callahan's finishing her Rockstar series soon. I'm very much looking forward to that, to the new Kristen Callahan. Um, Kennedy Ryan right now is writing a book about a screenwriter and a director and it's time slip. So it's both, it's like the, um, it's the main characters. Um, and then the character, then it's like a biopic that they're working on the, 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 the main contemporary characters. And then there's like the embedded Harlem Renaissance romance that I'm incredibly excited about. Oh my gosh. Um, Adriana Herrera has her first uh, category um, with Harlequin coming out. And I'm extremely excited about that, about a Dominican um, actress and um, no, a Dominican actor and the girl he's loved his whole life. So, I mean, there are some, and then um, Alexis Staria has a new book coming out actually too. Nisha Sharma has dating Dr. Dill, which is coming out in the fall, I think. And then, um, which is uh, he's a love doctor. Like he he doesn't he <laughs> he it's like leaves. Isn't it supposed to be like Hitch? it's the shrew? But oh. um, yeah, and he's a he's an Indian love doctor, and she's looking for like a love match. And then um, Alexis Staria has a new one coming, which is is exciting. it going to be connected to Hamila? Okay, yes. one of the sisters or something the or. Sister. One of the sisters. So that's all. And then new Lisa. 
Sophie Jordan has one that I haven't read yet. She's saving that for me. I mean, like lots of historicals. I feel like we're in a place. Oh, and I, I, I'm not, ex I'm excited about this coming out, but I've read it. So it doesn't count, but there's a new Joanna Shoup series starting. Yeah. Um, and it's starting with the heiress hunt and it is yeah. great. Crystal's so. read that one too. I haven't read yeah. that yet. I read that one. So love Joanna Shoup. She's great. She's she great. is. I yeah. love it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you guys who are watching, you can throw in some more questions now. I only have a couple left of my pre-picked ones. So we'll maybe go for a little bit longer here. Not keep we want Sarah to get her Lisa Claypa, so she needs to be able to <laughs> I know. It's less about you guys getting my book and more about me getting Lisa's book. Just to let you know where I'm at in my head. <laughs> yeah. I mean I think, that'd be my motivation too. <laughs> yeah, I know the answer to this one because I've heard you say it before, but um, do you ever get reading slumps and how do you get out of them? Yes. Um, I don't, I didn't. And then we had a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people started reading more, but I found yeah. really, really difficult to yeah. read more. Um, I used to be this time last year, I was reading a book a day. And yeah. then, and like maybe over the last, I've read maybe a book a week over the last yeah. year, which is um, a big, big downturn <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my reading slumps are busted by old reliables. Yeah. Um, I always go, I go back to books that I've loved, um, and by authors and authors who I know are just like deeply reliable for me. So like, mm. I think Tessa Bailey is wildly skilled. And so when she has a new book out, I like buy it and I save it on my Kindle for like when yeah. I know I need just like a sure thing. And, um, I feel that way about, um, a handful of writers who I just think who like I save up break in case of emergency books. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the other thing that I do is I turn to like very quick and dirty, like fast yeah. reads that I know are going to take me like two hours. That Kindle um, unlimited category that's like two hour reads or something or like, yeah, I'm I'll tear through like most of the time I'm very like un unhappy with, with what I end up with from in there. Please don't tweet that, but it's true. And yeah. the, um, but like also there's, it's a good way for me to just like get that quick shot of like, okay, I'm going to finish yeah. it. But to give you a sense, Kate Claiborne is one of my very, very closest friends. And I have had love at first, or I had love at first on my um, Kindle from the moment she finished the manuscript in the fall. And like, mm. I just never felt like I would be able to give it the like read that it deserved because I was so slumpy and I, it didn't, I didn't even open it. Cause I was like, I don't, I know I'm going to love this book and I just need to be like in the head place for it. Mm -hmm. And I finally read it last month and then we did a podcast about it, but, um, and it's, it's gorgeous. And Isn't I just, it? oh gosh, I loved it so much. It's too. so romantic. It's so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> romantic that like I I I hate her a little bit for like how good this book is. It um, was astoundingly good, I thought. It was so yeah, good. but that's the thing is like really this year has been really rough for me. And so if it's been rough for you, I mean of course it has. We're all living through a national trauma. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that for me because well, as I said, I read oh, 700 books last year and I went to some of the dark, like I burrow into dark romance mm -hmm. because I can't read. So I can't read like realistic, happy, contemporary love stories when mm -hmm. I'm having like. That's I, my problem. I just yeah. died. Been like I, I'd already read them, but I re, I re binged all of Cora Riley's Mafia series. Mm -hmm. and I actually found two of my, I call them six star reads. They become my favorites, and I just was like, I just needed to be like the dirtiest, like nastiest stuff, yeah. and I just want to dive into it. And right now, I'm in the middle of that happening again because I've had some life stress. So I'm reading Pam Godwin. I don't know if you've read a Pam God, if you've read Pam Godwin before. No, she has. Oh gosh. She has a pirate historical romance, by the way. I'll say that. That's where I started. Well, I'm getting it right now. Oh, I mean, there are, there are things I can't tell you about. Amazon.com send. Yeah. It's called. <laughs> What's but it called? It has, it's called Sea of Ruin. And it's a I mean, female pirate. It's I'm a female read it. I'm going to read out of that. <laughs> and it's just so, a chance romance with her husband. 
And I'm not oh, going to say anything else because I want to. I'm, gonna well, buy, I'm buying it right now. Yeah, it's the most beautiful. It's fantastic. But anyway, beautiful cover. Yes. <laughs> wild i was not expecting this cover it's you should all go look at this cover it's very beautiful well most of the people right. watching Bye. this i've been pimping this book for okay. a year and a half so they, i read they, it okay. because of jen and i yeah. i really did not think i would love it and i yeah. loved it okay yeah. i just yeah. bought it so, just it's bought fantastic it. um but she has this series that's um called deliver and it's about sex trafficking and so i was like i Ooh. want to read yes that's a lot and, same face, but she has another book I also love. And so for two years in a row, she was my favorite read of the year. And so yeah. I'm okay, I'm going to trust this author. Yeah. So I started the series and it starts with the very first one is it's a male. It's a, it's a young Christian man gets kidnapped into sex slavery. Wow. And I was like, Talk about taking the finger. Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> bold. <laughs> What are you doing, Pam? And <laughs> I'm on the fifth book in the series with him. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> Because I'm, each time there's another hero that I'm like, how the fuck will I like him? Yeah. And then, so that's amazing. I um, am similar to you. I go dark instead of light. Mm -hmm. Like when I am in anxiety. Yeah. But I don't usually go that dark. But I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah. I don't. And I only use it because it's Sam Gottman. Because I don't Look, think. This is my it. point about romance. It's like we are a huge pool. Everybody okay. gets to swim in it. Yeah. Everybody gets to find the place in the pool that they love. And like, stop shaming people for what they love. It's not real. You are not yeah. sex trafficking young Christian people. Oh, yeah. So she she's. I should say this. There is a content warning for. Her. Okay this because there's a kidnap by there's a kidnapping situation in this book but yeah that's useful. i i know the book that you've read and i think you'll appreciate what she does with <laughs> it by the end of it thank you jack for pointing that out i forget because it's my favorite book and i'm like what there's no content warnings read it and then i'm like yes there <laughs> is <laughs> yeah <laughs> i feel like I'm that just needs to be at the beginning of every fate of mates episode like we don't actually know <laughs> we we are right. like blo we are like we it's like we have, you know, some people have like facial blindness where like they, they just like, they meet people and then they just don't remember them. Yeah. <laughs> they re yeah. don't remember their faces. Right. I feel like right. we have that problem with like really everything yeah. in romance. Well, <laughs> so. well, and oh my word, sorry, I got distracted. Chris, I did not freaking know you were doing this. They're going to do a look at that. Comment. Look at that. Okay. So, whew, just got a little excited because she's amazing. Um, but one of my friends does a dark romance podcast. And so she does her content warnings at the beginning. And I always am like, for me, kind of like dark romance is a content warning, but I talk pretty openly that I don't have any triggers. So yeah. when I'm reviewing books, I try to be as, but I don't even know. There's so many triggers, like anything can trigger someone. So I'm of the thing of like, to be a responsible reader, you need to be protecting yourself as well. So if you don't know your triggers, then I, then I can't like, I you think know, like, I think, um, I think Goodreads, you know, is amazing for that. Mm -hmm. Like yes. following certain people on Goodreads really gives, I feel like people who need content warnings can find them now on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. And that was not the case however many years ago. And, um, I'm really grateful for that as a writer, like, because yeah. I don't know necessarily where, what I'm writing that might trigger people. So I'm very yeah. grateful for readers who are, who are open about where they think content issues. Right. Lie. Right. Yeah. That's a, and I mean, it's a conversation that, that needs to happen. Um, and it is one that I myself have been a part of a lot of them because I'm someone who I, I just told, I'm reading a sex trafficking book right now. If you hear what that's about and you still are like, Oh, I'm going to read it. I can't help you. You know what I mean? Like if I tell you, yeah. when I review and I say, this is about a sex trafficking ring. What do you think's happening in it? But also when I think when it is harder is when it does happen in a contemporary or a historical a surprise. Yes. I also think covers are making this a lot harder right now. And like, <laughs> I know this is a, like, yes. whatever, this is a different kind of conversation for a different yeah. time. But yeah. I think that often in for, especially in contemporary with illustrated covers, like illustrate covers, we're yeah. not being prepared properly for what's mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. totally the agree. story anymore. And that is a problem for mm -hmm. a lot of us. Um, yeah. 
And I think like sometimes it's as easy as like, how sexy is this book? Like, do I want, if I want something super sexy, am I going to get it out of this? Um, right. But also it's happening. Like it's, they all have that kind of rom-com feel. And then you're like, wait a second, like this has parental death as like the yeah. plot of it. Yeah. And well, wasn't the one by Helena Hunting, the meat cute? It has that cute on the front, and there's some major like trigger warnings in that oh, really? book. Really? Yeah. Like, of so I mean, of, like it looks so fun. Like we're sharing a soda, and it's about like <laughs> so. <sighs> you know, but such is such is how it goes. But let's see, see if some people had some fun stuff in here. I would just talk the whole time, but lots of people happy for Sea of Ruin. I'm very excited. I won't say that it was my goal to find a way to bring that book up to you while we, you were with me, but it wasn't not my goal. Well, just happy. <laughs> Call Pam. Tell her you want your cut. I know. <laughs> my favorite. Like that's the reason why I'm a booktuber. Why I do this is because I am a single woman who lives alone, and especially during the pandemic, it was hard. So the only way I feed my romance soul is to <laughs> pimp books out to my friends. I feel this way too. <laughs> so. But yeah, all right. Well, anything, Crystal, I've been yakking this entire time. Do you have any <laughs> comments to say or questions you have? I mean, you know, I'll. No, I, I think that this has just been a fabulous conversation. I've just loved hearing you talk, Sarah. I could listen to you talk about these subjects just for hours and hours. It was, it was wonderful. I, I'm perfectly happy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. You guys. Well, thanks so much for being on. It was fabulous. Oh. Your books just mean so much to us. So we were so happy that you agreed. And you've really made, like, Crystal's being really modest and shy, but she's your biggest fan. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Anyone Crystal's I'm about to cry. You, I'm trying not to cry. I follow you on Instagram, <laughs> and I lust after your hair. And also, um, I love your dog. And I can't figure out how you have taught your dog to stay away from you while you are on the ground, while you are exercising. Because I have a dog who is terrible. So I that often a- just, like long for your skills at both booktubing and dog training. <laughs> I always like that. Just the other day he pounced on me and I'm like, all right. <laughs> I, I watched the video of him like waiting for you to finish like lifting. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, no, Kahlo would, he would die. He would get crushed by a weight. So we haven't okay. gotten him to stop squeaky toy while she's filming but he'll stay I know I I (laughs) took his squeaky toys away so he doesn't have them right he's right down here on the floor (laughs) I saw him kind of I saw his head go by it oh yeah (laughs) I love it all right well we'll go ahead and sign off tonight guys thank you so much for joining us thank you for reading these books with us Sarah thank you for taking some time away from writing for us and yeah we thank you so much you're writing so (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much guys have me back sometime Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay.